Uh, welcome everyone to the um, sixth talk in our summer colloquium co-organized by Harvard and MIT, Society of Physics Students. My name is Min Chol Park, and I'm an undergraduate studying physics at Harvard. And I'm one of the organizers of our colloquium speaker series. I'm here today with my co-moderator, uh, Kwan, and we are very honored to have Professor Francis Hudson from University of Wisconsin-Madison to speak with us today. If you have any question at any time, you can raise your hand in the Zoom participant sidebar and we will call on you, or you can privately send a message to me and I will ask for you. We will prioritize those who raise their hands in order to make our event feel as conversational as we can. In the spirit of keeping this a more relaxed and personal conversation, we also request that everyone be muted unless they are speaking and also have their video on if you are willing and able. And now before starting the talk, let us briefly introduce today's speaker, Professor Francis Hausen to you. Um, he is the Gregory Braid Professor at UW-Madison and a theoretician in particle physics, astrophysics, and cosmology. Professor Halsen initiated the construction of Amanda, a first-generation neutrino detec detector located in the South Pole. He later became the principal investigator of IceCube, an array of optical sensors buried uh, deep in Antarctica. And in a 2013 breakthrough, IceCube detected the first high-energy neutrinos originating from outside our galaxy. So thank you so much, Professor Halsen, for giving a talk at Shiloh this week. And please, thank you so much. Thanks uh, for this introduction. And yes, this is a bit of an unusual talk for me. So if anything is not clear, it's also rather an unusual subject. So if anything is not clear, let me know. Uh, so the, the menu of today is you see on this slide. And so I'm going to introduce what a neutrino is. I suppose most of you know, but in this talk, it plays a slightly different role. Then I'm going to introduce neutrino astronomy, the concept. Then I'll show how IceCube became the first neutrino telescope. And then I'll start, I'll discuss the results. We of course made the neutrino map of the universe. And then we eventually in the last uh, couple of years start to first to see the first sources of neutrinos, which you could refer to as neutrino stars. So that's the talk. Then, uh, and the science. Then uh, as suggested by the organizers, I'm going to take a little bit of time at the end to tell you a bit about the history of the project and uh, and how it originated and how we realized uh, the results that we have now. So uh, I, my slides are not advancing suddenly. Uh, let me try this, okay. So the question what the neutrino is, well, I suppose you know, but the origin of the neutrino is uh, the picture on the left here. You see, when uh, the neutron decays, it decays in a proton, an electron, and a neutrino. Now, of course, at around the turn of the 19th to the 20th century, people watched the decay of neutrons, and they realized that occasionally the electron and the proton would go off in one direction, which, of course, violates energy and momentum conservation. So for if you observe something like this, it must be that there is a third particle that balances the energy and momentum. And But they didn't see that particle. So there were actually for a while two schools. Niels Bohr suggested to give up energy conservation, but Pauli, you know, Pauli was the conscience of physics at the time, and he said, no, there must be a particle that we don't know and that carries the energy. And the fact, you know, they, you, they of course observed the electron and the proton, but they didn't see the, neutro, the neutrino. There was uh, no trace in the apparatus of the neutrino. And so, that's why it's referred to as a ghost particle. It's there, but you don't see it. And uh, interestingly, now, this would be considered the discovery of the neutrino. 
many particles in particle physics were di discovered by this technique, the missing momentum techniques. And so it's a standard at the LHC and everywhere else. It's a standard technique for discovering particles. But uh, in those days, they only knew three elementary particles, neutrons, protons, and electrons. And they couldn't imagine that there were more particles in nature. So uh, the neutrino was rediscovered in 1956 by Reines and Cowan. And, uh, but the experiment, the missing mass experiment was done and the data were carefully analyzed. And in fact, uh, the experiment was done by Ellis and Mott in 33. And they actually showed that the neutrino had no mass. It had no charge, it had no mass. So it's something like a photon, except the photon interacts. It's reflected by a mirror. It doesn't go through light. The, the, go, the neutrino as its ghost particle, it didn't show itself. It didn't manifest its existence in any way. It didn't interact with the detector. So what's the connection of the neutrino with astronomy? In fact, uh, Reines, who was the discoverer of, of the neutrino, I actually knew him, met him several times. And he told me as soon as they knew that the neutrino was an, a real particle in 56, that everybody had the idea, look, it's neutral. It has no charge, uh, it has no mass, it's just like a photon, so you can do a neutrino astronomy. So the concept exists since 1956. The, the real question was, how do you detect these neutrinos? Because, you know, they, they barely, they, Ellis and Mott uh, saw no trace of it except the missing momentum. And so now we have to concentrate on the story where the neutrino suddenly become important. You know, a, a, a photon you can detect with a mirror. So why go bother and why bother detecting neutrinos? Uh, and so what I show here is a map, a distribution of the energy that reaches us from the universe. So as a function of the wavelength of the light. You see, this is the frequency of the photon in Hertz, and it goes from radio waves here to gamma rays here. So you see, this is, this is the amount of energy that reaches us in radio waves from the universe that we capture at Earth. Then you see, if we go to the energy of uh, EV, atomic energies, then we of course see the CMB. And that of course, uh, the CMB deposits a huge, sends us a huge amount of energy to Earth. The, the 411 photons per cubic centimeter, right? And then we go through infrared light and then we go eventually visible light, blue light, X-rays, and then eventually the highest energy radiation is in the form of gamma rays detecting by satellites uh, above the atmosphere. But look what happens. When you reach the TV region, this flux just turns off and we don't see the universe. So this game of going to higher and higher energies or lower and lower frequencies stopped a TV energy. And so the universe turns dark. And the idea is to do astronomy in this dark universe with neutrinos. That was the goal of neutrino astronomy. Uh, why does the universe turn dark? It's very simple. Suppose some source produced light of this very high energy, very far away, and the photon travels towards Earth, but over cosmic distances, this photon travels through the microwave background of 411 photons per cubic centimeter. And so eventually, it will interact with a microwave photon and produce an E plus E minus pair. So that photon never reaches us. That's why the universe turns dark. Uh, we don't detect it. It loses its energy 
long before it reaches the earth. And uh, so what's wrong with any plus and minus pair? Well, you cannot do astronomy with charged particles. You know, we discover uh, cosmic rays uh, more than a hundred years ago. We have protons reaching us with much higher energy from uh, extragalactic sources, from sources in our galaxy, but we still haven't figured out where they come from, how they are accelerated, why they are, how, uh, where they are produced. And the reason is because they travel through the magnetic field in our galaxy and through magnetic fields outside our galaxy, they get bent and they don't tell us the direction they came from, where they originated. And so this is uh, the reason, of course, neutrinos, they don't have that problem. So this is the origin of the cutoff. You see, that's the photons lose their energy on the microwave background before they reach Earth. There's nothing you can do about it. Of course, a neutrino doesn't have that problem. Just like in the Ellis and Mott experiment, it doesn't interact with your detector. In fact, it doesn't interact with anything. And so neutrinos actually reach us from the beginning of universe and from the edge of the universe without being attenuated or without being bent. So it's actually a better cosmic messenger than, than light. The problem is to detect them. And so that's the problem Ice Cube finally solved uh, many, many decades later. Is this problem, is it worth looking at this uh, sky, this dark universe? Well, uh, that's of course a question. What if there's nothing there? Well, we know there's something there. We know there are cosmic rays. And uh, for instance, I remember how in 1991, uh, a rather modest experiment in Utah, in the Utah desert, discovered a cosmic ray of 300 million TeV. You know, I was by that time a particle theorist. If you tell me, you know, the, the Large Hadron Collider in Geneva uh, produces energies of 14 TeV, one four. This is what nature can do. And in fact, uh, if you think about it, if we wanted to be, build an accelerator with LHC magnets to accelerate that particle, you would have to, build, to, to fill the orbit of Mercury. It's a simple calculation you can do. So how can you not spend the rest of your, your life trying to find out where these particles come from? <laughs> and that's what I did. In fact, I was already at it at that time. Uh, how do you detect neutrinos? You don't detect neutrinos with a mirror, as I said, and but we know how. I mean, this is the super Kamiokande experiment in the Japanese Alps. What you need is water, a clear liquid, and uh, photomultiplier tubes that detect light. And so the problem with this experiment is very big, but it's 10,000 times too small to do neutrino astronomy. In fact, how do you know it's 10,000 times too small? We don't know. But during a couple of decades, theorists, including myself, tried to estimate how big a detector you needed. And this was our, our best estimate. You could build this detector. You had no guarantee of seeing neutrinos from the cosmos. But most theorists thought if you build a detector that's 10,000 times super K, you have a chance seeing them. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, this is, of course, uh, it's not a real picture, but this is what our detector looked like. This is Ice Cube. It's uh, light, detect light sensors, photomultipliers, and instead of water, it's size. So you see here, there is a string, a kilometer long of... Uh, instrumented with 10 inch photomultipliers. At the top of this string, you are a kilometer below the geographic South Pole. So this, uh, at the South Pole, you actually stand on three kilometers of ice. 
En een kilometer diep, die string starts instrumented with photomultipliers. If you look 125 meters away, there is another string. And 86 of these strings on a grid spaced by 125 meters uh, instrument the kilometer cube of clear natural Antarctic ice uh, with light sensors. And that's ice cube. So another way of looking at this, uh, this is the geographic South Pole. And if you go one and a half kilometers, you see there you have 5,106 10 inch photomultipliers. And then you are still about 450 meters from the bedrock under the South Pole. So this is basically three kilometers of ice of which you instrument this part. I will, uh, I will explain later what uh, the tracks mean. But so uh, just to make clear, the South Pole is here and that's where this experiment is right in the center of Antarctica. So the experiment was constructed and launched from uh, the physical sciences laboratory at UW Madison. And so it's you go by plane to Christchurch, New Zealand, and there there is a base, a logistic base that will uh, from which you launch a nine hour flight to McMurdo base on the coast here. And then it's another three hour flight to the South Pole. And so everything had to go through, uh, fit into a plane and go in pieces to the South Pole. So it's a bit like building a ship in a bottle. So here I come, I'll come back later in the final comments, but here you see the concept of the construction. You see, look at this picture. At this moment, there is no hole there. There is a, over 2.5 kilometers, the ice has been transformed into water over a width that's large enough to let a 10 inch photomultiplier to go through. And so you deploy the equipment, then you let the water refreeze, and then you do this 86 times and you have the ice cube detector. I'll come back to this at the end. But this is how you detect uh, uh, neutrinos. So here you see that's the actually the online display of the experiment. You see these are the strings in with little white dots of seven or with are the photomultipliers. And you see the neutrino comes in. What does this neutrino do? Well, it goes right through your detector. But about one in a million neutrinos will actually hit a nucleus in an ice atom. And I mean the nucleus, not the atom. And when it hits the nucleus, it makes char it makes a nuclear reaction and it makes charged particles. And where, whereas the neutrino doesn't emit light and you cannot see it, these are charged particles traveling at high speed through the ice and they emit light. And so uh, when the, one of these particles is a muon, and this muon can travel for kilometers. So if you're lucky that this is uh, the type of neutrino that emits a muon, it, you have a good chance it go through your detector and it will not just tell you that there was a neutrino, uh, it will tell you that uh, the direction, because the muon is aligned by the neutrino. Uh, you notice this neutrino comes from below the horizon. We actually, to make sure we see neutrinos rather than other radiation, we look through the earth. So from the South Pole, you look at the Northern hemisphere at the sky above Boston. And so in case you didn't get this, here is another picture. This is the movie. And you see how this muon comes in, it travels at a speed of flight and you can see by eye the direction. Our computers rep reproduce the direction of this muon uh, to 0.3 degrees. Uh, so not 0.03, sorry, 0.3 degrees. 
So another way of looking at it, this is the theorist view. Uh, here I will, this is a Monte Carlo simulation of this muon. So it traces the muon through the ice and it follows every photon it makes. And so you can see how this works. Uh, this, of course, is called Cherenkov radiation for those. So the neutrino travels at a speed, the, the muon travels at a speed of light, but the light in the, in the ice travels at three quarters of the speed of light. So it makes a shock wave. The, the muon outruns the light it makes. And the, the shock wave, of course, gives away the direction of uh, the neutrino. So we built this experiment, took many years. Uh, I will come back to the history later. And I think it was in 2011 or 12, uh, I remember seeing this web page from New Scientist. And it told the world's biggest physics experiments, and it tells you what the probability is, the chances that they detect something. And you see, it's very interesting. Here they mention Atlas, Detector Higgs, and they gave it odds for six to one. Uh, so only one chance in six that they were successful at detecting the Higgs. LIGO, they gave one chance in 500 to detect the gravitational wave. And we were still, they didn't know we were ice cubed by then, but they gave us also one chance in six, like, uh, 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 like the Higgs discovery. And you know, look how lucky we are. All these things happened by now. Uh, and you could actually bet on this page. It was live. And so you could bet money. And we all bet money on LIGO, and then they took it down. <laughs> but I can tell you, after having spent by now 13 years of my life building this detector, it was not funny to see this web page. <laughs> it was really depressing because they may be right that we had only one chance in six of seeing a cosmic neutrino. Well, in 2013, we saw cosmic neutrinos of the universe from the universe. I actually show you the flux we measure, the energy. This is you are looking now uh, at the energy reaches reaching us from uh, the universe in neutrinos. And uh, so you see, we had two ways of doing this measurement by then. And uh, so that was the discovery of uh, high energy neutrinos. So exactly at the range where light doesn't reach us anymore. And so of course the hope now is to discover these famous cosmic accelerators uh, in the sky uh, that make the cosmic rays because uh, the highest energy particles in the universe are cosmic rays, they're not photons. And now the highest energy particles are also neutrinos. So uh, we took it from there. And uh, so the question now is, where do they come from? Because of course, to make neutrinos, you need pions. Neutrinos are the, produced by the decay of pi mesons. And the details are not important, but pi mesons, you can only produce by protons. So if you see a neutrino coming from somewhere, it was produced by a proton accelerator. And a proton accelerator, of course, those are the famous accelerators uh, that we don't know about, but that produce this cosmic rays of energy up to 300 million TeV. So we started scrutinizing the sky and we really, uh, it was a bit depressing. The sky we saw was totally uniform. You see here, I actually, you see the Northern sky, which we see these muons that we can reconstruct very well. And so what I cannot show you, this map contains 670,000 neutrinos. 
So it was the data from the first decade of the experiment. And so what do you look for? What's a neutrino source? Well, the problem with ast neutrino astronomy is that the atmosphere produces neutrinos. And for every cosmic neutrino that we see, there are like, you know, a million atmospheric neutrinos in this map. So to find the source of cosmic neutrinos, you have to find some place in the sky where you find more neutrinos than on this very uniform background made in the atmosphere. And they have on average higher energy because the atmosphere is not good at making. So if you find, you know, a, a 10 PV neutrino, and we have seen some, so I mean 10,000 TV, that cannot be produced in the atmosphere. So you look for clusters of high energy neutrinos that are unlikely to produce in the atmosphere. And uh, when, so the map you are looking at shows the probability that there is a concentration of neutrinos there with high energy. You, it doesn't show the neutrinos themselves. And this is the hottest spot in the sky. And after 10 years of data, this hotspot is 5.2 sigma. And uh, it's aligned with an active galaxy, NGC 1068. Now, active galaxies, before we start this, were one of the favorite candidates of sources that could possibly create the energy that accelerates the cosmic rays. And we then would see the neutrinos from the pions uh, produced by the, in the cosmic accelerator. And so uh, this, uh, we actually saw 80 events on the background of atmospheric neutrinos. In fact, we can model our experiment. We understand this. We can model from A to Z the, this observation. And so we can actually show that it takes more than 400,000 trials to produce this source by accident. And that's also 4.2 sigma. So no matter how you look at it, this is a definite discovery. This uh, uh, includes all the trials. There are no hidden trials. So what's an active galaxy? Well, to produce, you not only have to produce high energy particles, if you look at the total flux of, of, uh, of energy, the energy flux in cosmic rays, it's enormous. So the only way to get it is uh, one of the concepts, they're all connected to black holes. This, so every I idea that generates every theory that possibly can explain the cosmic rays uh, involves black holes. And so what you do is you basically tap the gravitational energy of the black hole to accelerate particles. And I'm not going to do a lot of theory here, but you can imagine this is an active galaxy. What does it mean it's active? It's cannibalizing its own galaxy. So the gas, the stars, the electromagnetic fields, it's eating its own galaxy. And so a lot of matter is flowing into this black hole. Uh, you see like, uh, it's called the accretion disk, like when your bathtub em empties. And when these particles fall into the black hole, there are many different ways. There are many theories how you can accelerate them. But also a lot of matter is, is you know, is clustered in a small region of the black hole. So you're accelerating particles in a dense region of gas and, and photons. And so by PP and P gamma interactions, you produce pions that decay into neutrinos. And so we can actually, we, we have a good idea how to model this. And one of the interesting things is that the data tells us is that this is happening at uh, less than 100 Schwarzschild radii of the black hole. So it's not happening in the jet or 
you know, wherever. It's actually happening right on top of the black hole. And so, you know what the Schwarzschild radius is. This is the picture uh, of the black hole that came out one and a half years ago or so. And so this is a Schwarzschild radii. So it's in this close vicinity to the black hole that these neutrinos are produced. We actually found evidence for uh, two other sources, TXS0506 and PKS 1424. And since then, these results are being presented this week at the Cosmic Ray Conference in Nagoya. Uh, we also found evidence for NGC 4151 and NGC 3079. All these sources are active galaxies of this type. So I think we begin to get hints of, uh, it's not a proof yet, and but of what the sources of, of the cosmic rays more than a hundred years after their discovery. In fact, this source, TXS0506, we had seen before. That was not a surprise. And in fact, it took us 10 years to finally find these sources. And we got frustrated. And in 2016, we tried something new. And that's called multi-messenger astronomy. What we did is when you see an event, OK, you now know what you're looking at. This event, once the data comes above, above the detector, we have a data center. And that data center has a cluster of computers, which actually does a first reconstruction of this event. And it's normally, this event is sent over satellite to Madison, further analyzed, and then sent to the collaboration. But what we started doing is send the direction of this event over Iridium to astronomers in real time. In other words, typically less than a minute, 30 seconds actually, after the light comes through the eyes, it's in a telegram on the email or on the web page of any astronomer in the world. And so what happened in 2017 is that this event, which has an energy of 290 TeV, is likely a cosmic neutrino, uh, it was discovered that it came from the direction of uh, TXS0506. And uh, so, in fact, it was a real surprise for us. We didn't know whether anyone paid attention, but actually, uh, at some point, more than 20 telescopes were looking at the direction of this neutrino. And in fact, one optical telescope was looking at it after 73 seconds. And uh, they made an important observation, actually, uh, which I won't discuss here, because, uh, but actually, which clinched that this was a real source of neutrinos. Uh, so, what did we see? You see here, you see uh, the direction of TXS 0506. And these were the reconstructions, the, the first reconstruction and then the later Madison reconstruction of the direction. Uh, this can happen accidentally one in a thousand times. But sorry, but what happened is that then uh, a ground based telescope figured out. Uh, that this was also a source of TV gamma rays, which uh, kind of uh, reinforced uh, that this, this association was real. And then it was really proven by this optical telescope later. We actually, now we knew where to look in this map, right? So we looked at the direction of this source, and this was the data in the past 10 years. And what I've been talking about is this little blip. It's a burst of neutrinos totally dominated by this 290 TV event. But we actually found in our data this huge flash of neutrinos in 2000, at the end of 2014. And so that again supported 
the fact that this is a real association. One of the interesting things about our observations is that we actually uh, didn't see the galactic plane. Here you see the data, the, the little red dots. This, this is a picture of the sky. The little red dots are well-reconstructed muon neutrinos and the big circles are electron and tau neutrinos. But none of these neutrinos, this is in galactic coordinates. This is in coordinate where this is the plane of the galaxy. And so this is the Milky Way when you go out and look at the sky. So you're supposed to first see sources of light in your own galaxy that are nearby because the next galaxy is very far away. So you see your own galaxy first and then you see these little dots, some of them are extragalactic sources in Fermi. We didn't, we only saw the universe. We didn't see our own galaxy. And it's only a few weeks ago that we finally managed to identify our own galaxy. You see here again the Milky Way, the gamma rays. I won't go into how we did this, but here you see our own galaxy in neutrinos. But if you could see the universe in neutrinos, you would have to squint. It doesn't stand out like in all other wavelengths of light. And uh, so it means that in extragalactic, in, in other galaxies, there are sources of neutrinos that are stronger and that don't exist in our own, in, in our own galaxy. And, you know, I put my money on the fact that we don't have our galaxies and active. We don't have the neutrinos produced by the black hole, which has been dormant for 100 million years or so. Uh, yeah. 100 million years or so. Uh, anyway, but we found it. It's there at the 10% level. As I said, you would have to squint. So that's the history of uh, Ice Cube. And I want, I promised you in the beginning, I spent a little bit of time on, on telling you, you know, you imagine that uh, this project Projects like this are done by NASA, except this one doesn't fly, so it's not done by NASA. So who does it? Well, someone like Fermilab or, uh, well, you're wrong. This subject started, this ice cube started with an idea in 1988 at the University of Wisconsin by pure accident, because a postdoc and I were working on detecting the radio emission from neutrinos interacting in ice. And that idea went back to 1963. So that was the idea of ice. But uh, then it's not difficult to think, you know, why, not, why the radio emission is difficult. People are still trying this, actually. And we made the first calculation showing that there was enough energy in the radio signal made when a neutrino interact. It meant it emits Cherenkov in, in the radio waves. Why not do it in, uh, you know, in, in light? And so that's how the idea came. The combination of, of working on ice and, and, and using normal light of putting, uh, photomultipliers in ice. Where do you find ice? Well, in a lot of places, but at the South Pole, you find not only ice, three kilometers of it, as I explained, you also find a station that can provide the support to build such an experiment. And so what happened between 1988 and now? Well, it took us 13 years of R&D to show that this idea worked. And we built a small detector called Amanda. And uh, of course, what does it mean, you know, to, that it works? Why wouldn't it work? Well, there are many reasons why it wouldn't work. Uh, first of all, we had no idea with the ice we would find 
would be clear enough to build a particle detector. And you saw how these photons in one of the simulations, these photons travel over hundreds of meters. And so this is the clearest, me we discovered the clearest medium. You can make, cannot make a medium this clear in, uh, in the lab. And that is because the purity, it's, uh, you know, in the center of the detector, uh, 60,000 year old snow that fell on Antarctica was compacted and is ultra pure. So how did we show it worked? Well, it showed it worked by detecting atmospheric neutrinos. You know, I, I, I told you we have this background of atmospheric neutrinos. Uh, we collect uh, 100,000 of them every year for these few events that come from the cosmos that you saw on these maps, about 10 a year instead of 100,000. And, uh, but we showed how we could detect neutrinos and, and measure their directions. And I can tell you, uh, this was the most excited I ever got in the project. All the rest was, uh, was a postscript because by then we had spent a lot of money and we still didn't know whether this would work. And you said, did you know you were going to discover cosmic neutrinos? There was no guarantee. You know, it was back of the envelope by a theorist. And, uh, but I thought if you build a detector so, so unusual, we would do something interesting. I was totally relaxed after that. <laughs> but uh, so we did discover uh, cosmic neutrinos in 2013. Uh, we've discovered the diffuse flux. The first source was uh, TXS in 18. Uh, we discovered uh, a very interesting event for particle physics, which I don't have the time to talk about. But then we discovered first sources a year ago, and we just published the galactic plane, which uh, everybody realized when you see the galactic plane, that's real astronomy. Now, you say the history will remember that you, you know you invent hot water drilling, you put by photomultipliers in Japan, put them in the ice, turn on the detector, and you see the universe. <laughs> well, it was hard. And so I'm going to give you a flavor. So not all physics starts at Fermilab or, or CERN or NASA. This was our first construction of photomultipliers in 1993 for the Amanda experiment. Now, I was a theorist, I had no lab. So this picture is taken in the place where the theorist had their uh, table tennis room. And so I took the table tennis table away and we started building uh, Aman Amanda sensors. You can imagine how popular that makes you among your colleagues. And this was the group in Madison. This was the first two graduate students. This was an undergraduate. This was a postdoc, Sarah Tilov. She is a professor in Delaware now. And this was my, a scientist in Madison who's now retired, living in Hawaii. And so you see here the first photomultipliers. They went into the ice and they were. And so this was not, you know, big science yet. Uh, you had to overcome three challenges. First challenge was to put the photomultipliers in the ice. The second one was to understand the ice as a Sherenkov medium. You know, we cannot take the ice and go and put it in a test beam at CERN or at Fermilab. You have to study the optics of the ice totally remotely. And that's what we did. We you have to characterize the optics of the ice. That was the second challenge. The last challenge was to look through the atmosphere, which produces uh, not only cosmic neutrinos. If you look in the Southern hemisphere, it produces cosmic ray muons at the rates of 3000 per second in our detector. So we, uh, I'll come back to that. So I'll go through how we solve these problems. So in order to tell you how you put photomultipliers on in ice, 
I'll show you a, a, a little movie, but it's referred to as hot water drilling. The system is shown here. It's like a, a circus train, but uh, the wagons are on sleds instead of on ice. And so you move this circus train from hole to hole to deploy 86 holes and to deploy this 5,000 under 60 photomultipliers. As I said, you transform, you don't make a hole, you transform ice into water, then quickly deploy your phototubes and then let it refreeze. So it takes a 4.8 megawatt heating plant. And uh, so I'll show you this movie next. So this is how it works. The top 80, 90 meters of the ice are snow. So you just melt it. Then the rest of the way, you go with this hot water drill, which is just a nozzle. And out of this nozzle comes hot water under pressure. And it just falls by gravity. And after two days, you have transformed two and a half kilometers of ice in water. And so, as I already mentioned, the, you have to push 200 gallons per minute through this nozzle at uh, boiling temperature at 90 degrees. And then you get there in about two and a half days. So here is the circus train. This is the main module, which is uh, the drill tower. And you see their line setting it up. And this is a hose, which is about, uh, well, you can see how thick it is. And it's two and a half kilometer long. And so it goes in one shot to two and a half kilometers. Now, how do you make the hot water? You make it uh, by just burning fuel and about 40 car wash heaters. They are a bit souped up, but they are basically 40 car, car wash heaters produce this 4.8 megawatt. Here you see the drill after two days, the drill coming out of the water. And so at that point, you move to another site, but here lined up are the 60 photomultipliers that are going to go in this hole. And you see them here, they are in pressure vessels, of course, uh, because uh, that are tested to 10,000 PSI. They go through enormous pressures when the hole refreezes. And you see, you built a string, you just let the the cable go down, the cable brings down the voltage and bring back the, the, the signals. And you see, that's the last time you see your photomultiplier when uh, you let it sink to two and a half kilometers and you wait until uh, the water freezes, which can take a couple of days. Uh, so that system deployed, instrumented 86 holes without uh, it was a, without any failure. It was a fantastic, you know, handling boiling water in a place where the outside temperature is minus 50 C is a non-trivial exercise. And so uh, it was an amazing achievement. I am not even going to try to explain to you how we figured out the optics of the eyes. I'm just going to show you a picture of how well we actually know the optics of the ice. This is the dust content of the ice measured by ice cube. And you see, let me just, this is somewhere close to, so you only see a fraction of the detector. We, we have ma uh, mapped the dust in this very clear ice. The absorption length in some places approaches 300 meters. It's typically between 100 and 250. And this is the deposition of dust by one volcano that erupted 74,000 years ago. So it deposits the dust of this volcano in, uh, is seen over about one centimeter. And we actually, it's called the Toba eruption. It was known to the geologist. There was a problem because it was not detected in ice cores, but we actually detected it with the optics uh, mapping we did of the 
of the ice in the ice cube detector. But this is a long story to how we figured out how photons propagate in the ice. Uh, the last I refer to is cosmic rays hitting the atmosphere, make pions that decay in neutrinos at an enormous rate. So the cosmic rays come in, they hit an air nucleus, make a pion decays into neutrinos, but they also make muons. And many of these muons can penetrate to our detector. And they trigger the detector 3,000 times every second. So we have to find the events I showed you, first removing all these muons, and then removing the one atmospheric neutrino we see every four minutes, 100,000 to about a handful of cosmic, of cosmic neutrinos. So that was the first, uh, uh, the last uh, challenge. And I can show you, this is ice cube neutrino taking data. And you see all these muons coming through it, 3000 every second. And in that we have to find this uh, handful of cosm cosmic muons every year. And so that was the third challenge to make this experiment work. And uh, I think most of people thought this was a, a really cute idea that would never work for these reasons. But we, we solved all of them and uh, made the, the science possible that I explained to you. So this is the end of my story. And of course, we have a collaboration. And there it is. We gather two times a year. And you see all these young people. They are the ones that did the science, not me. Thank you very much. I'm happy to answer questions now. Thank you so much, Professor Hassan, for the amazing talk. So now we are moving on to the Q&A session between the speaker and the audience. So we explained in the beginning of today's event, please raise your hand in the Zoom participants sidebar, and we will call you on your screen also privately, send a message to me, and I'll ask for you. So we want to make the chill room as conversational as we can. So we would like to generally prioritize the ones who raise their hands. So uh, please hit. So uh, first we have uh, Ben. Hello, thanks for the super cool talk. That was super fascinating, thanks. Thank you. Um, yeah, I have, let's see, let me ask you two questions. First question is, um, I didn't quite get, why does Ice Cube observe the Northern sky again? Ah, yeah. <laughs> uh, actually, we do observe the Southern sky, but as I just explained from the Southern sky, if you're at the South Pole, you look up at the Southern sky, and then you see this enormous flux of cosmic ray muons going through the detector. And so we managed to do this, but we are less sensitive by a factor of about five. So a really powerful way is to look through the earth. And of course, the, the, the earth absorbs these muons. And uh, it's, it's still not easy to get rid of this because if you misreconstruct one of them, you may think it's a neutrino. You know, you, you have to catch all the ones that come from the southern sky, make sure they don't come from the northern sky. So if you make one mistake in a million or so, you, you still have a background. Anyway, uh, in the, the simple idea is that muons are absorbed. And so when you look through the earth, only neutrinos come through the earth, because remember, they don't interact with anything, uh, or very occasionally. And so it makes it easier to look through the earth. And so from the South Pole, you detect neutrinos coming from the Northern Hemisphere. Interesting. Thanks. And then the other question I had um, was the, uh, could you explain the relation between, okay, so I know that the cosmic rays can create like the neutrinos and muons when they hit the atmosphere, 
Um, but was there another relation between cosmic rays and neutrinos and muons? Like, how do the, those three things? Well, like, the, the, the yeah, the relation. I actually should have put in a slide on that, but I didn't want to get into the particle physics details of this. Uh, so, you know, how do you make neutrinos at all? You go to Fermilab, and there is an accelerator that accelerates protons. You shoot this proton beam in a target. It makes pions. And then you let the pions decay into neutrinos. That's the way you make neutrinos. So you need a proton beam. When you go to, you know, uh, places where they have electron accelerators, they don't make neutrinos. You need protons to make neutrinos. And protons, of course, that's what, what astronomers call cosmic rays, right? Most of the cosmic rays are protons. That And so, uh, what we figured out now is that the best guess of what produces cosmic rays at the moment, I won't claim it's proven because we have a handful of sources. There may be other uh, sources that are the origin of neutrinos. We don't know. But all the ones we have evidence for right now are these active galaxies. And you can immediately make the association with Fermilab, right? the particles falling in the black hole are somehow accelerated and they are accelerated in this uh, in this very dense region of matter and radiation around the black hole. So you have a target for the protons to make neutrinos, to, ma to make pions and the pions decay in neutrinos. And so if you see a neutrino source, they are made by a proton. So they are made by a proton accelerator, so cosmic ray source in the sky. Is this clear? <laughs> mm, okay, so the the cause, so like somehow the neutrinos are all from high energy protons. So the neutrinos yeah. we don't care about are from the cosmic rays that hit the atmosphere. The neutrinos we care yeah, that's about a are black from- hunt, right? It's the same thing. I mean, the protons hit the atmosphere, they make neutrinos too. And these uh, neutrinos are not the ones we are interested in. Uh, by the way, we have collected about a million of these background neutrinos because we measure them. And uh, of course, we can do other physics with the atmospheric neutrinos. We can do neutrino physics rather than astronomy. And a good fraction of ice cube is doing that instead of doing what I've been talking about. Interesting. Thanks a lot. Oh. Okay, nice. We have Michio. Oh, yes, Professor. Uh, thank you so much for the fantastic talk. And I also want to, uh, I want to like ask about the kind of like future direction of the ice cube project. So now that you have detected this um, galaxy plane, um, a picture i just wonder like what is the kind of like next goal or kind of like more kind of like long-term goal of this ice, ice cube project in the future well, that like oh yeah yeah i mean so this is astronomy like uh you know with one telescope so uh i think for the future what we need is the first thing we need is more telescopes and so there are various projects. There is a project to build a, a telescope like Ice Cube in the Mediterranean. And uh, they are actually under construction. They have deployed the last time I looked something like maybe 20 strings. Uh, and uh, so hopefully we have uh, a telescope in the Mediterranean soon. So they use water instead of ice. That was the original idea, actually, uh, to use water. And it turns out, in fact, you know, the idea was that deploying uh, phototubes in ice at the South Pole is actually technologically simpler than putting them in deep ocean water. And that insight we had in 1988. 
and people thought we were crazy probably but we were right <laughs> you know we built a telescope 10 times 10 years before or more before they they started doing this in water uh there is a telescope being built which is like half complete in in lake baikal and it it has seen our cosmic neutrino flux at the level of three sigma so they've kind of already confirmed the the diffuse flux we see and their highest energy event comes from the direction of the excess of five or six <laughs> but uh, their angular resolution is not that great yet but it's interesting then there is a telescope being developed partly by people from IceCube in off the coast of Canada and then China has two projects to build telescopes in uh, in the south in the South Atlantic and so there is a lot of activity now what you really want is a, a telescope that 10 times bigger and so one of the two Chinese projects have actually proposes a telescope that's 30 times bigger than ice cube and uh, we have proposed one that's eight times bigger than ice cube and it's totally developed by now we have a technical design of it it was reviewed by the decadal review of astronomy and endorsed uh, so we hope to build that telescope you realize that when we build ice cube we really were not sure about what the optical properties of the ice were so now we can uh, we can optimize the design and with the optimized design we can build a detector that's basically an order of magnitude larger than ice cube for the same cost uh, because a lot of the electronics that was expensive you know you can now buy at radio shack <laughs> it's this this detector and the, the data acquisition system was uh developed in as you can see from the history the r d period it was de developed uh, and the proposal for ice cube was submitted in 99 so this is uh, you know electronics that's already very old um so basically like if we have a larger kind of like larger telescope compared to the ice cube then the yeah. benefit that we can get is that we can like basically detect more like more like activities related well, to the tree. You can imagine now, you know, we found this one source, which we definitely believe is five sigma. And then you look at three sigma level, you see four or five other sources. If you can go another order of magnitude, you will see a whole sky like in gamma rays, right? So, the same uh the interesting thing is i didn't say this but we see the galactic plane but we still don't see sources and we even and the gamma ray people you saw this picture beautiful picture of the fermi nasa satellite in gamma rays where you see the all this bright galaxy they have they haven't been able to identify the sources either. They have guesses, but they haven't really found. So, so we probably now can make a better guess of the sources of extragalactic neutrinos than what galactic neutrinos. But now that we see the galaxy, we of course are on to trying to find sources of cosmic rays in our own galaxy. The, the best candidates, just like some of the best candidates were active galaxies even before we found them uh, the best candidates are supernova explosions for producing the cosmic rays in our own galaxy and this theory comes from Zwicky in 1930s so what? almost 100 years ago but it has never been proven it's in every textbook <laughs> but it's and we are not sure so that's a kind of the next attraction is to find the sources of cosmic rays in our own galaxy and it would be nice to prove Zwicky right 
or maybe not. <laughs> we'll see. I see. That's really interesting. Thank you so much. All right. So um, we're taking less. So probably yes will be the final question for today. Okay. Hi, Professor. Thanks for the amazing um, presentation. I have a question about, um, like you said, that we're considering different candidates or sources of the neutrinos, um, of the galactic neutrinos. How do you discern um, the different sources? Is, is it an energy thing that high energy neutrinos? Are yeah, the same, way, the same way as we see extragalactic sources. Okay, so if you, you, got... you know, we look for clusters of high energy neutrinos coming from a particular direction. It's a good question because what we want to do, actually, I think we have our best chance not to find them in our own map like we did with some of the sources I mentioned, but to do to find them like we found TXS0506. And that is by taking very high energy gamma ray sources that astronomers and suspect being possible proton accelerators and cosmic ray accelerators and uh, concentrate, look for concentration in the direction of the high energy gamma ray sources. So we may actually solve the problem by multi, this is referred to as multi-messenger astronomy, right? I see. So you're using uh, gamma rays to infer about yeah. the direction of the neutrinos that you're observing and see if there's like, it's coming from the same source. Because right. there is another thing I, I didn't go into, but of course, if you produce pions, you produce charged pions, which uh, decay into neutrinos, but you also produce neutral pions, which decay into two gamma rays. I see. Okay. So for every neutrino, there is a there are a couple of gamma rays, and they have actually higher energy. Mm -hmm. So this is not a, you know, this is 1950s particle physics. So, and uh, this is a whole other sub subject of, but, you know, with uh, TXS, we actually found correlation between the gamma rays emitted and the neutrinos emitted. It's complicated. It's not okay. as simple as I explained, because the gamma rays, they, the neutrinos come with the energy they are produced in the accelerator, but the gamma rays don't. Remember, as I explained, they lose energy in the source right. and then later traveling through the microwave background. So it's difficult to trace them, to track them. But for galactic sources, there should be two gamma rays per neutrino. And the multi-messenger uh, technique is, is much simpler and should be more powerful than us trying to identify the sources by ourselves. But we will try, of course. Right. So so a follow-up to that is that if you detect these neutrinos and they come in different energy levels, and like you said, they're produced by a proton being accelerated around, say, a black hole, then how do could we infer properties of that black hole from the neutro neutrinos that we observe? Well, that's, of course, the next thing. Uh, these neutrinos come from so close to the black hole that actually to get, I showed this picture of the black hole. So that's the environment where these neutrinos were produced. That's very, this is the dream of neutrino astronomy come true. You see neutrinos originate in a place no gamma rays escape or they escape, but come with much lower energy at Earth. So, but on the other hand, you know, we need really more neutrinos to do intelligence studies and contribute to, to the astronomy. But, uh, you know, that picture of the black hole took, you know, a whole network of radio telescopes many years to pinpoint this one and a half radius light, light uh, Schwarzschild's uh, size uh, light ring. Uh, and so there is actually a proposal of to look to look at NGC 1068 and to take a picture of the black hole with uh, 
with radio interferometry. But this is challenging. You just, the, you know, the telescopes like ALMA can get there. But this is, you know, gamma rays are produced by mostly by jets in, in active galaxies. These jets uh, originate uh, a thousand times farther from the black hole than what we are talking about. Mm -hmm. Can can neutron stars also be sources of yeah, energy? It, of, indeed. So, uh, you know, the, the leading theories for extragalactic sources of extragalactic cosmic rays were gamma ray bursts and active galaxies. But mm -hmm. there were kind of other uh, uh, ideas. And, um, you know, it involved pulsars, right? Which are also black holes, mm -hmm. where you'd use the spin down to accelerate protons. And, uh, but we haven't, as, as I said, we haven't seen very much, a handful of sources, but they are all active galaxies. Okay. Yeah. Just, just, I don't want to take too much time up, but um, following up on Mitchell's question about further development in this area, and this might be a little far-fetched, but um, you know, the recent discovery of there being a lot of ice on the lunar South Pole, where there is no atmosphere, I, I was just thinking that, you know, having this kind of project on the moon, potentially 10, 20 years from now, would solve that, you know, problem with all the noise that comes from the atmosphere. Well, this is uh, an old, of course, everybody, a lot of people have thought about this. And in fact, you could build uh, a detector on the moon, which has no atmosphere. And that has also been told, uh, told about. In fact, there was a committee who investigated this many, many years ago. I think it was in the 80s. Because remember, people wanted to, to do neutrino astronomy. You know, the idea was around and compelling since 1956, as I said in the beginning. Once they realized neutrino is a real particle, like a photon, it's not only an obvious idea, it has a lot of attraction because, you know, you can do astronomy from sites from which light doesn't escape. Like, for instance, NGC 1068. And uh, well, the light eventually escapes. We think the modeling thing shows that it probably comes out at MEV energy below the threshold of the Fermi satellite. So they don't see our photons. But if we had an MEV satellite, they would probably see it. Anyway, so. Uh, Again, it would be more powerful to, to be able to do multi-messenger astronomy. But yeah, we need uh, more telescopes and better telescopes. Of course, if you build bit, bigger telescopes, you would also get better angular resolution, right? You know, you would look at tracks that are kilometers long and uh, you would reconstruct them sub-degree which of course also helps. You can improve your detection by either getting more neutrinos or getting better angular resolution on each neutrino you detect. And these telescopes do both. That's awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, so to conclude, as a tradition, we would like to ask uh, Professor Heisen, for a quick word of advice for young physicists looking to start a journey through physics and research. So could you please, Professor? You mean if I have advice? Yeah. For young people, well, be lucky. <laughs> That's uh, my advice. Uh, but uh, yeah, I think my the advice I always give to to young people is don't worry about career, don't worry about money. You can only be successful when you are totally, you know, obsessed with the subject. Being interested is not good enough. To be, uh, 
to be successful, you you have to be totally immersed, and and that's you know what, what I followed. I I went to university and started as an engineer because my father had a construction company, but then I escaped, <laughs> and I was a theoretical physicist for half of my career. And as you know, I started in in thousand in. 1988 this project and uh, I think I was more successful at this as at my theoretical physics career because uh, you know you don't discover anything every day that's not the pleasure you get out of physics you know I, I got mo most of the pleasure out of being a theorist in understanding things that I never thought I would understand. Imagine it was exciting when I started and you worked on black holes or quarks, you were a nutcase. They were, you know, cosmology was not respectable science when I started. And quarks were something, you know, respectable particle theorists didn't work, work on. By the way, I worked on both, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, you see, I and so most of the pleasure you get out of of learning things actually, and uh, but uh, once you know I got in involved by accident in this project. I told you I was doing something with ice, and uh, then I learned about neutrino astronomy. You just connected to right, and and. Uh, the project to cough and uh, it's something you know you can it's an it must to be an obsession to for you to be successful and so follow you know as i say follow your dreams no follow your interest and don't worry about anything else because the problem is if you don't you know you'll have a miserable life and be unsuccessful right? <laughs> being unsuccessful is okay but having a miserable life is not okay you have to really enjoy what you're doing. And of course, the chance that you'll be successful will be much bigger. Thank you so much, Professor, for the really 